Let's move on to imaging of patients with tinnitus. When I ask students, how do you define tinnitus? Most people will say a ringing in the ear, but tinnitus is really more broad than that. It's any noise that a patient perceives that's not caused by external stimuli. It can be a ringing, it can be a buzzing, it can be any sort of noise, a whooshing sound. So uh, we wanna be more broad with our definition of tinnitus. We divide tinnitus into pulsatile tinnitus and continuous tinnitus. Pulsatile tinnitus is a rhythmic sound that follows the heartbeat. Not any rhythm will do, it has to be the same rate and rhythm as the heartbeat, then it's pulsatile tinnitus. Continuous tinnitus is any other rhythm or no rhythm at all. We image pulsatile tinnitus with enhanced CT of the temporal bone or CT angiography, they're not that different from one another, we do this because we want to look at the vascular structures that are usually the source of pulsatile tinnitus. For continuous tinnitus, we use uh, MRI of the temporal bones and internal auditory canal because we're looking for lesions of the cerebellar pontine angle cistern and brainstem. You can also divide tinnitus into subjective and objective tinnitus. Objective tinnitus is when the uh, physician, often with the assistance of a stethoscope, can hear the same noise that the patient is appreciating, uh, often a bruey sound. Subge subjective tinnitus is when the noise can only be appreciated by the patient. So what causes pulsatile tinnitus? The bottom line is that vascular abnormalities cause pulsatile tinnitus. Examples include an aberrant internal carotid artery in which the internal carotid artery takes a detour through the middle ear, a persistent stapedial artery which is an enlarged uh, fetal communication within the middle ear, a dehiscent jugular bulb where pulsations from the jugular vein can be transmitted into the middle ear cavity because the bone overlying it, the jugular plate, is dehiscent. A high riding or aberrant jugular bulb, usually with a diverticulum. Arteriovenous malformations, dissections, aneurysms, true vascular anomalies certainly can cause pulsatile tinnitus. And importantly, venous stenosis, outflow insufficiency, is a newly recognized and important source of pulsatile tinnitus, as it may reflect intracranial hypertension. The aberrant internal carotid artery is a critical radiologic diagnosis because if it is overlooked or missed, it can have disastrous consequences for the patient. The way that an aberrant internal carotid artery arises is that the carotid foramen is stenosed or absent, and the blood flow into the internal carotid artery through the skull base needs to find a new path. The path it uses is through the inferior tympanic canaliculus, which is a small hole just anterior to the jugular bulb. The blood flow comes through the uh, tympanic canaliculus, flows through the middle ear, usually via the stapedial artery, and then rejoins the normal petrous internal carotid artery. So it's running through the middle ear. You can see the enlarged inferior tympanic canaliculus adjacent to the jugular bulb, and you can see an absence of the carotid foramen. This is an important diagnosis because otoscopically, the surgeon sees a pulsatile red mass in the middle ear. And thinking that it is a glomus tumor, the surgeon may biopsy the lesion and confirm that it is a paraganglioma. This has obvious disastrous results when what you're biopsying is the internal carotid artery. It's not necessary to do a conventional angiogram to make this diagnosis, but it is a pretty picture that is worth showing. This is the internal carotid artery and coming up to the skull base, normally it should curve medially and then up into the carotid siphon. In this case, the internal carotid artery swings out laterally into the middle ear and then resumes its normal course. This is called a figure seven sign on 
uh, conventional angiography. Another enlarged collateral artery is the persistent stapedial artery. There's a normal stapedial artery that runs right between the crura of the stapes. Uh, when it becomes enlarged, it splays the stapes crura away from one another and it covers the oval window. Although this looks like an oval mass on a single image, obviously on sequential images, it will be tubular. The persistent stapedial artery becomes enlarged when foramen spinosum is stenosed and the stapedial artery is used to communicate between the internal carotid artery and the middle meningeal artery. There is a normal bony covering of the jugular bulb called the jugular plate. When that bony covering is dehiscent, pulsations can transmit from the jugular bulb into the middle ear and can be audible as pulsatile tinnitus. So you're looking for a lack of bony covering overlying the jugular bulb. Normally, you should be able to see the jugular plate as a thin line. Here's the same thing on axial images, the jugular bulb here, a lack of normal jugular plate covering it, separating it from the middle ear cavity. Another way that the jugular bulb can cause problems is if it comes up too high, if the jugular bulb extends too superiorly. This is called a high riding jugular bulb. How high does it need to be in order to be considered high riding? Uh, different authors differ on this. Some people say it needs to reach the basal turn of the cochlea. Some people say it needs to reach the bottom of the internal auditory canal. Uh, I think if it gets that high for either one of those thresholds, you're probably dealing with a high riding jugular bulb, particularly if it corresponds, if it corresponds to the side of the patient's symptoms. Another thing that can go wrong with the jugular bulb is a diverticulum. This is sort of the normal shape of the jugular bulb. Now, the jugular bulb is quite variable and it can be different in size depending on your, whether you're on the dominant side of venous outflow or not. But if you see a little outpouching, which is not part of the flow, that's a jugular bulb diverticulum. And even in the absence of a dehiscence, the jugular bulb diverticulum, because of its turbulent flow can still cause pulsatile tinnitus. Another way to get pulsatile tinnitus is to have an aberrant jugular bulb that de is dehiscent into the vestibular aqueduct. This little line right here represents the vestibular aqueduct, and this is a high-riding jugular bulb, and you can see that there is no bony plate between the vestibular aqueduct and the jugular bulb. Uh, this is a potential source of pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, shout out to Andy McCall. When you have a focal stenosis in an arterial or a venous structure, you get sudden increase in velocity of blood through the strictured area. That rush of blood can be audible as pulsatile tinnitus. If you have unilateral venous stenosis intracranially, it usually results in unilateral pulsatile tinnitus. When you have bilateral venous stenosis, you can have difficulty determining which side is the pathologic side. We are seeing an epidemic of bilateral venous stenosis, that is venous outflow insufficiency in Western countries. This is most likely related to the obesity epidemic. Venous stenosis, venous outflow insufficiency is associated with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, the disease we used to call pseudotumor. It's not clear whether the venous stenosis causes the increased intracranial pressure or whether increased intracranial pressure causes venous stenosis. I kind of think it's the venous stenosis that is the causative uh, one, but it, it's not been it's not been proven. But these areas of focal stenosis are what you're looking for to diagnose either unilateral venous stenosis or bilateral venous stenosis, which is venous outflow insufficiency, an important and increasingly common cause of pulsatile tinnitus.
one of the most common sources for venous stenosis is enlarged arachnoid granulations. These are also associated with increased intracranial pressure. You can see here filling defects, cystic filling defects in the venous structures. This can occur in a jugular bulb. It can occur in the, uh, in the sigmoid or transverse sinuses. Uh, you can even get compression of veins in the neck resulting in pulsatile tinnitus. So sometimes patients with pulsatile tinnitus will undergo a contrast enhanced CT of the neck. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for venous stenosis. Remember that arterial stenosis, even as low down as the carotid bifurcation, can also result in pulsatile tinnitus. This happens to be a patient whose pulsatile tinnitus was attributable to her fibromuscular dysplasia, classic radiologic appearance of this string of beads uh, to the distal internal carotid artery. Uh, but the point of this slide is that arterial disease, including dissections, atherosclerosis, uh, and fibromuscular dysplasia can be a source of pulsatile tinnitus even when it is halfway down the neck. Okay, we finished up pulsatile tinnitus. Let's speak briefly about continuous tinnitus. What causes continuous tinnitus? Cerebellopontian angle tumors uh, can cause that. We've talked about that in the previous part of the lecture. Multiple sclerosis, particularly if it involves the brainstem. Chiari malformation can cause all sorts of symptoms, continuous tinnitus among them. And then there's this concept of muscular tinnitus, where the suspensory muscles of the ossicles start to twitch, pull on the uh, ossicles uh, improperly and cause a continuous tinnitus. That happens to have no radiologic manifestation, so I'm not going to show any example of that. And we're going to just move on. What do you suppose the most common cause of tinnitus is? The most common cause of tinnitus is hearing loss. You can think of this as once you stop hearing the things that are outside your head, you start hearing the things that are inside your head. So when I see a patient history that says hearing loss and tinnitus, I am focused on the hearing loss because if I can find a cause for the hearing loss, I have usually explained the tinnitus without additional diagnosis. I mean, still run through the, uh, the list, particularly in cases of pulsatile tinnitus, uh, but you should be satisfied uh, with finding a source for hearing loss in patients with both hearing loss and tinnitus. This concludes the section on tinnitus.